Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Views expressed by participants are personal. Do you work in digital media? If so, then you already know how comprehensive it can be. You could be working with anything from data to content to search and social, and that's not even the full list. But today's guest, Celeste Normington, has seen her career grow with the evolution of digital media. Celeste started out at the old Toronto.com, which offered local search engine advertising solutions well before Google was known for it. From there, Celeste moved to all of media, where she rose through the ranks from sales executive to management, working on everything from monetizing partnership inventory to leading their charge in the mobile solution space. Leading French-Canadian news company La Presse came calling, tapping her to lead sales in their Toronto office. Celeste has since pivoted away from content and media sales, joining Palmerex Data Solutions where she is currently their head of data sales and product strategy. We chat about everything from growing up in small town Ontario to the culture shock and excitement that came with teaching English in Japan. And we even compare notes on what reality shows kept us from attending class in university. Palmerex is uh, the company that owns the Weather Network, which is something I didn't realize before I started at the Weather Network. Uh, but it's it's a, you know, 30-year-old company that has provided weather to Canadians for, for that long and has a really trusted brand within, within the Canadian space. Um, I started at Palmerex three years ago, and my role has evolved much like data and technology have over the past three years. When I started, we were really, really focused on the location data set that, uh, that we have. Uh, which is amazing, um, and and it has evolved as we, you know, made acquisitions like the acquisition of Addicted Mobility, as the data marketplace has changed to, you know, eliminate cookies and and you know everything that's going on with IDFA these days. Uh, so it's it's evolved, and really, my job is to make sure that we're staying one step ahead of the market, and that we're always able to essentially inform and educate our clients on on what's happening. I think data and tech can be a little bit scary and, and feel a little bit intimidating or overwhelming sometimes. And the reality is if you have time to actually, you know, look into it, think about it, do a lot of reading, it's not that hard. It's just so many of us are so busy that we don't necessarily have the time to dedicate, um, you know, two hours of your day to reading tech blogs. I want to go back to the beginning. Where are you from? I am from a, a really small town down kind of between London and Windsor uh, called Wallaceburg, Ontario. Most people have not heard of it. Those who have understand me instantly. Um, it's small. It, it, it's still small. It's, it's about 10,000 and, you know, small enough that we didn't have a movie theater or a mall. We didn't really have anything for, for me to get into trouble doing, uh, but big enough that it wasn't, you know, super, super teeny. I wasn't shocked when I went out into the big world. But I think, again, still small enough that it gave me like a lot of confidence that maybe I shouldn't necessarily have had. Yeah, it gave me gave me a lot of confidence that I had a rude awakening about when I actually went away to university. But we'll save that for later. <laughs> I had to Google Wallaceburg and find it on the map. Like I know where Sarnia and London are and everything yeah. else, but I'd never heard of Wallaceburg. So that was new to me. Uh, so you touched on a little bit, but what was life growing up like in Wallaceburg? It was quiet. It was really quiet. We, you know, we rode our bikes around the subdivision and we used to go to the park uh, and my mom would stand on our front porch and she knows how to do that knuckle whistle, you know, that really loud knuckle whistle. Very that's how I knew it. it was. Yeah, that's that's how I knew it was time to come home at the end of the day. So it sounds really idyllic, and and in a lot of ways it is. I think for everyone, you need to find a place where like your resting heart rate kind of matches the tone of the the town or the city or the place that you live in. Um, and so for a lot of people, it's an amazing place to you know grow up and raise kids because it's a slower life, but. I have the resting heart rate of a hummingbird, and so <laughs> I, I always felt I always felt like uh, like like there was something else I was kind of looking for. I think you alluded to it already, but you spent most of your childhood and your teenage years in Wallsburg, right? I did, yeah. 
And then you left Wallaceburg for the first time to go to university, specifically Western University in London, which isn't too far from Wallaceburg. But was there a bit of culture shock or just shock in general going to what must have seemed like a huge metropolis? There wasn't necessarily a shock of going to London. I had, you know, I had an aunt who lived in London and being from a small town, that's that's where we went to do our shopping, you know, our back to school shopping. Uh, so I was familiar with the city itself. And my brother had actually gone to Western a couple of years ahead of me. So I felt a little bit familiar with the campus. Um, but what was a shock to me was just the number of driven individuals that there were in the world. Again, you know, in high school, I was I was in all the plays, I was on all the committees, I was not an athlete, so I was not on any of the teams. But, you know, I channeled myself into a number of, of leadership roles and going to Western where, you know, Western's a really, really big school and everybody was trying really hard and everybody was raising their hand in class. And I, I honestly, for the first time in my life, was really intimidated by the people around me. And um, I think it was... I think it was a really good reality check uh, that, you know, you're you're not the only smart person here. You're not the only driven person here. And you're going to have to work really hard to get to the to get to the top of this pile. So would you say it was overwhelming for you then? Super overwhelming, super overwhelming. I was, you know, a straight A student in high school. And I think it took me all four years to get my marks back up just because it was it was a really different way of learning and um, and it was a lot of independent learning and I had to do it on my own. And I definitely felt like a fish out of water for a really, really long time. Um, you know, looking back, I wish I had done things a little bit differently. I wish I would have tried a little bit harder, but you know what? University is, is all about learning how to be a grown up. And uh, it was it was hard and it was uncomfortable at times, but I also made a ton of really amazing friends and, had a lot of really great experiences. So yeah, I, I, I wish I would have gone to class more and watched a little less TLC, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but all in all, I'm, I'm so glad I went there. It was, it was a really good experience. What was your TLC show that kept you from going to class? Oh my God. Like just the, a baby story, a wedding story. That was like the advent of reality television. And I remember having entire days where I was like, no, this is what I'm doing today. Because they do an entire afternoon rotation of just the same show. It was like binge watching before, I guess, binge watching was a thing with the streaming services. When I was in university, I guess the two shows that really pulled us in were, oh, God, it was Gene Simmons' Family Jewels on A&E, speaking of the cable stations <laughs> on that dial. And then the other one was, wasn't Gene Simmons, it was The Osbournes. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And that was, like, it was... Oh my God, do you remember how hungry you were for that kind of content? It was mind blowing. I think The Bachelor came out around the same time and we just didn't understand the the model behind it at all and thought that people really were falling in love. But yeah, it was. It was... <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. We were so naive. <laughs> we were so naive. I mean, we were children, really. Yeah, no, that was a that was a good period in television. They say that this is the golden age of television, but man, let's not look past the Osbournes and uh, no. The Bachelor. Not to digress, but something I learned about the Osbournes, or at least I learned about myself and my friends, is that much music would show it uh, censored. So they'd bleep everything Ozzy said because every other word was the F word. And yeah. then I remember it was either much music or, or, or CTV. They would show it uncensored at like 1130 at night, and it just didn't have the same effect. Like you needed the bleeps in order to laugh. <laughs> It just his like, swear words were too mumbled. The bleep had a, a bigger impact. <laughs> the bleep really made it seem like he was unraveling in front of a group of people, <laughs> whereas it just seemed like, I don't know, grandpa's angry about something when you had the uncensored version. <laughs> well, it makes you realize just how manipulative that form of television can be, right? Like how editing works and, and how we can be manipulated as an audience. It's so interesting as like an actual study to know even just celebrity culture, how our how our opinions are manipulated by publicists and, you know, stylists and et cetera. It's yeah, it's it's all really interesting. And we didn't know any of it then. It was also brand new. Let me ask you this, because this is something that when I was at Brock University, a lot of students did as well. They would forego watching 24 when it was when it would get its first window or its first run on Fox, literally mm -hmm. wait for the DVDs or I guess for season one, it was the VHS tapes. And they would <laughs> literally wait and they'd be like, no, you have to watch this in like an entire weekend. 
Uh, did, yeah. did you find that as well? Like, were people doing that? It was so weird to me that people would hold back and be like, no, I don't want to watch this. I'm just going to wait six to eight months, and then I'm going to watch it when it comes out legitimately on DVD. Do you know what? I totally did, and I totally did it with 24 specifically. But it was that new sense of, like, control or power because – I feel like, and I could be 100% wrong, but that's just when, you know, serialized TV was being put on DVDs. And so it was the first time that, you know, as the consumer of the product, you could make that decision. It wasn't like, you know, I I remember in high school or even elementary school, high school, I don't know, I don't want to date myself. I'm very young. Um, But, you know, (laughs) if you missed an episode of Friends, you just didn't know what your friends were laughing about for, for the next week, right? Um, where I, I think, yeah, by the time I was in university, stuff started coming out on DVD. It obviously wasn't streaming services yet. And yeah, binge watching became a thing because again, refer to my TLC comment, laying on the couch for an entire afternoon is a really great way to spend the day sometimes. It is. I hear you. I think a lot of us are doing a lot more of it than we'd want to right now, though. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all sick of it now. We're like, okay, that's enough. Maybe, maybe a little bit of scheduled activity wouldn't be a bad thing. After university, though, you didn't do what most people do and say go to the big city like Toronto or maybe go out west of Vancouver. You packed your suitcases and you relocated to Tokyo. What brought you to Japan? I think I wasn't ready to be a grown-up quite yet. That was Um, a really honest answer. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, um, after you, you step out of, you know, your library for the very last time and you think, okay, is that all I'm ever going to learn in my entire life? I just wasn't ready to start buckling down and and getting a job. But in addition to that, I university, as we talked about, made me realize what a sheltered upbringing I had had. Again, a really great upbringing. But, you know, our our vacations in the summertime were going to a cottage. We didn't travel abroad very often, actually at all. Um, And so I think I just wanted to see a little bit of the world that I hadn't seen before. I buckled down and, you know, got a mortgage and an actual responsibility. So uh, in my last year of university, I had a friend who was in Korea. I had a friend who was in China and I had a friend who was in Japan Um, and they were all teaching English, but like different iterations of teaching English. Some were in schools, some were in, you know, um, in private companies. Uh, And I really just looked at it and, and decided Japan was was the way to go. So was Japan then your first time getting out of North America? Uh, yes. Yeah, it was. I'd, I'd gone on some, some vacations, but they were, you know, American centric. I'd, you know, been to Las Vegas and, uh, and, and, and a few sunny islands, but yeah, that was all very North American based. Um, so yeah, it was my first time outside of North America and I really just decided to go to the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm a big proponent of travel. Like I tell anyone who will listen, like just get out of your comfort zone and go travel, or especially if you get the opportunity to do it on your own at a young age, like at a university, the way you did. So talk to me about the culture shock. You, you had to have felt some sort of culture shock going to Japan. But what did you learn about yourself in that year and a half? It, yeah, like extreme culture shock. It is, it is a very different place and it is wild and wacky for all of the right reasons. And, you know, as I was 25, no, 24 at the time, um, really, really open to all of those wild and wacky experiences. But I think what I learned about myself is number one, that like, you can do anything. You just set your mind to it and take it one day at a time. You can do anything. You can figure anything out. Anyone who knows me will tell you that I um, like my geospatial awareness is terrible. I don't know my left from my right half the time and I cannot find my way out of a wet paper bag. And the Tokyo subway system is, I would say, intimidating. Um, But you take it one day at a time. You may you take it. You get off at the wrong stop two or three times. You realize the world does not come to an end and you just keep going. It was it was a a really, really crazy place. I also learned how how much my family kind of impacted who I was as a person. It's weird when you're separated from those people who are near and dear to you for the first time, really, in your life. And you can kind of like feel your mom coming out of your pores and your reactions. Just I think that space between the two of you. So it really kind of drove home. My dad always had a crazy work ethic. 
Um, you know, he came over to Canada from Italy when he was a baby and his parents worked really, really hard. Um, and so that really came out in me where it was just like, you know, I, I was in Tokyo. I'll, I'll be honest. I went to all night karaoke a few times, but it taught you to get up in the morning and get yourself into work and, and to make sure that, you know, you can have fun, but you need to get your job done. It doesn't give you the day off just because you had a really great night. And also I felt my mom coming out of me and that, you know, she started off her career um, just working as a teacher at a daycare. And by the time that she by the time that she retired, she was managing Ontario Earlier's programs for for our entire center, which was given the opportunities that she was given a, a real leap. And she was a real climber. And, you know, by the time I left Japan, had been offered, you know, a supervisory position that I couldn't keep because I, I, I wanted to come back home to Canada. Um, but it, yeah, it taught me to get the job done and to work hard. And that hard work's kind of rewarded. So what was your first job ever? My first job ever, I was a banquet waitress at the only place in Wallaceburg where you could have a wedding or a funeral or a Christmas party. Um, and I was, I think, 14 when I got the job um, because I wanted my own money to spend. And uh, it was pretty terrible. It wasn't that terrible. I mean, it was fun. My best friend worked with me, um, but the pay was complete garbage because I was a banquet waitress. I couldn't serve booze, but they were able to serve. They were able to pay me, you know, the minimum wage where when you can serve, it's like a lower minimum wage. Yeah, because, because they expect you, you get to get topped tips. up with tips. Yep. Yeah, but I couldn't get tips because I was a banquet waitress. This wasn't, you know, a transactional waitressing position. I was just bringing them their cheesecake at the end of the day. Uh, so, but at least, you know, the uniform was also horrendous looking. So win-win. We've already mentioned that you went to Western University after high school, but we haven't talked about what you studied. So what did you do there? I was in a program um, that was uh, called um, administrative and commercial studies, which was essentially, I assume, Western's version of a BCom um, because they didn't have one. But uh, I don't even think the degree exists anymore. So I really have to explain it to people when I get jobs, which is why I like to stick around companies for so long. But essentially, the everyone took the exact same business courses in first year. And then in second year, you got to go into different streams. And the streams were business, uh, human resources, computer science, and then aviation management, like just the most bananas course you could ever take. But it was really fun. I did the human resources stream. Any particular reason you picked HR management? I I thought that organizational behavior was really interesting. There was an amount of psychology that that was included in the course load. And I just thought, you know, it was really, really interesting to understand the motivations and why people do the, what they do within an organization and how to kind of get the most out of people. Um, also, Wallaceburg was a heavily uh, factory oriented unionized town. And I thought, you know, understanding unions better might be helpful, although I don't think I've ever worked in a unionized environment since. But then I promptly went and did absolutely nothing with that degree, as many of us do, I'd like to say. So you graduate university. We've already established that you relocated to Japan. You were there teaching English for a year and a half. You come back to Canada. Where do you settle? I settled in Toronto. Um, essentially, I think Tokyo taught me Tokyo was my resting heart rate. Um, when we talk about, you know, your your heart rate needing to match that of your city. And so I knew that city living was was something that I really, really wanted uh, for my life. And so I relocated to Toronto, but basically, you know, I, I came home from Tokyo and my parents picked me up at the airport and were like, cool, you're living with us until you find a job, which will motivate you incredibly to find a job, moving back in with your parents at 25. And so a, a, a cousin of mine knew of someone who was hiring in, in the city um, and it was a, you know, entry level media coordinator position. And and so I went for that and, and was lucky enough to get it. And so that we could say is your first media role then? It was, yeah. It was the account manager for the local sales team at Toronto.com. And, you know, at the time, Google search listings didn't exist. Oh, I'm really dating myself. No one is going to believe the lie that I'm young. Um, <laughs> I remember <laughs> Toronto.com. I used it. 
Yeah, yeah. You'd go there if you wanted to know what restaurant you should go to. And, you know, people would pay to get their search listings at the top. It was, you know, Google clearly copied Toronto.com. But yeah, it was a lot of just putting listings up on the website and, you know, cropping and editing images and, and, you know, not exactly the most taxing job, but it got me into, I remember my 101 um, when I started that was like, this is an impression. This is what a CPM is. And this is why it's CPM and, you know, not CPT, et cetera, et cetera. So it really actually was a really good kind of foot in the door to this industry because it taught me a lot of the the basic things that, you know, I may have learned had I actually studied media in any way, shape or form. Was your office at Peter and King? Because I remember there was a building there near Shoppers Drug Mart that had a big sign that said Toronto.com. And I'm not sure if they just bought the ad space or if they were, that was the office. Yeah, yeah, no, that's where we were. So we were at King and Peter and Second City was in the basement. Um, and so it was really loud sometimes, um, but we were there. And then when Olive started, so Olive, um, Olive Media uh, started about six months after um, I started at Toronto.com and we kind of expanded and all of got booted into the basement right beside Second City, which was uh, wild in and of itself. Speaking of all of media, that's where you went next. And this was your first sales role. So talk to us about how you found it and what was the attraction to sales? I was terrified of sales. I didn't want to go into sales at all. I, <laughs> I found it really, really intimidating. Totally. Yeah, I think. Um, the idea of anyone, I was, I was still fairly young at the time. Um, again, my age is just going to come up thematically throughout this podcast. Um, but the idea of having a target to hit and, you know, to have a very measurable yardstick of your success or your failure felt really overwhelming to me. Um, and so I, but at the same time I had, so I, I was an account manager at Toronto.com for about a year. Then I moved over and was a, an account manager at all of media for two years and then moved into a sales role. And what I can say is the mentorship and the leadership at that company was phenomenal. And so while I found the idea of moving into sales really overwhelming, I had so many great um, mentors that were like, no, you've got this. You can do this. Don't worry about it. This is how you do it. This is, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time that it, it made it a, as intimidating as it was. It made it really easy because I knew I had help and I knew I wasn't doing it alone. I totally concur with what you're saying. I mean, being only as good as your last quarter, that's kind of hard to stomach. I mean, there's kind of this ongoing joke where it's like, if you hit your quarter, you look like a champion. But as soon as the next day starts, it's the refresh button. It's like, well, what have you done for this quarter? <laughs> and that's what you're measured on. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, it's a really, but you know, you thrive on the highs and the lows are horrendous. And that's kind of what keeps us as salespeople motivated, right? It's, it's the thrill of the close. In, in, since I started in sales, I've kind of gone back and forth. I went back and forth for a few years between management and sales and management and sales. And after a couple of years in management or, you know, even a couple of months in management, you really miss the close. Oh, the instant gratification that comes with it. Oh, yeah. you, you put your feet up on your desk for the rest of the day. Exactly. Let me ask you a so quick question about that, because you mentioned going back and forth between sales and management. As a manager myself, I think it's important for me to maintain a territory because it keeps you fresh. You can relate to the other sales reps on the team when they say, this is what my clients are saying. Do you find that as well? I I do think, I don't know that I can, you're, you're a hero if you can manage it and a team. Not a, man, not a huge territory, but just a small <laughs> one. Enough to know what's going on and still be you know part what? of the process. No, it's a really good point. I I feel in any leadership role I've ever been in that I should be able to go in and do my team's job at any point. Um, the, the sales team, I've managed a few different, uh, a few different headcount or a few different types of people, but I should be able to go in and sell anything just as well as they can, because if I don't know the product and its value proposition well enough to sell it, how can I expect to coach them to be able to as well? So I, I absolutely agree with, your, with what you're saying, but it can be challenging in practice, right? Um, you're, you're juggling a lot and you're wearing a lot of hat, but yeah, I do. I agree. It's really important. You've had a number of different sales hats. You could say at all of media, strategic account executive, and then your duties shifted to mobile. Talk, talk to us about how that differed from say your previous sales roles at Olive. 
for anyone who's unfamiliar with Olive, we uh, essentially were a rep house for, um, you know, major U.S. brands, um, as well as Canadian brands. So the New York Times, People.com, but also the Star and La Presse. Um, and around, I want to say 2012, which can we agree that was the year of mobile? Do we know? Is it still the year of mobile? Is it happening? Oh, the year of mobile. <laughs> and don't forget the year of uh, mobile video and then the year of <laughs> whatever. And this is just the year of COVID. We can all agree on that. Uh, but essentially, when um, around 2012, a lot of the uh, properties that we were repping uh, had either were coming out with mobile websites or they were coming out with mobile apps. And as a digital, like a web based digital sales team, we just didn't necessarily know what to do with that. It was, you know, kind of being kept on the corner of our desks, but, you know, a 300 by 50 banner was weird and, you know, integrations worked really differently. And so no one was doing a stellar job of selling it. And so they said, well, maybe we just need to dedicate someone to doing this. I think I had just come back from mat leave with, with my first child and they were like, do you, do you want to give this a go? And I was like, yeah, might as well. Like I've, I've been selling the same thing for, you know, the past two years coming back fresh, which I don't know if anyone can say they come back from Matt Lee fresh, but energized anyhow. And so I, it was a new and kind of exciting thing to be able to dig into. And I'm really glad I did because that experience has to a certain extent been, you know, the thread that has woven itself through, you know, the next few years of my career. From there, you were promoted to sales manager of all of audience. So talk to us about what all of audience was and it sounds like this was your first time managing people. So you're kind of less of a player and more of a coach now. Bit of a bit of a shock there. Yeah, um, it was. But I would say again, at Olive, everybody was such a close team that it was just kind of it didn't feel like moving into a leadership position. It was more just moving into a coach position where you were there to support everyone and make sure that, you know, all of your friends had everything that they needed in order to get their job done. And so. Yeah, it was it was a it was a really interesting step. It was learning a very new skill set, but but one I'm glad that I took. And so after nine years at all of media, Tor Star, just that whole group, which mm -hmm. is pretty amazing because not a lot of people in digital stay at one company for nine years, let alone three or four years. Mm -hmm. You moved on to La Press. Talk to us about that move. Like what attracted you to it? Did you feel that you had accomplished everything you could at Olive or was there just something so enticing over there that you wanted to make the jump to it? Olive was amazing. It was my home and my heart for, for yeah, close to nine years. I like to say I started six months after it started and I left six months after, before it ended. So I feel like I saw everyone and met everyone that, you know, walked through those doors over that almost decade. But yeah, I had gotten to a place where I, I felt like I had accomplished what I had wanted to. And I do think in this industry, we all feel a little bit anxious sometimes to only work at one place because you see people move around. And that's oftentimes how you make, you know, network connections and learn different product sets and just learn a different way of actually doing business. Um, and La Presse was at a really interesting moment in their transformation where they were moving their print publication over to tablet. Um, and given the fact that I had, you know, focused on mobile for so long, I thought that it was a really interesting shift. I thought it was a really bold move to turn off their, you know, print, the print iteration, what, you know, had essentially sustained their business for, um, you know, decades before that. I thought it was a really bold move to turn that off and to see if it was possible to create a fully monetizable business for print, but digitally. Um, and so, so yeah, I moved over there to help kind of build up that story in the, in the Toronto market. Going back to all of media, I got to tell you, I have never met one person who has said anything negative about working there. Like I had Jordan Brooks on a couple of episodes back and he was just gushing about his time at all of media. So it sounds like it was probably one of the, one of the great play, great media places to work at. It really was. I, I can't tell you the sense of camaraderie the like, team spirit that everyone had it honestly it taught me so much and has so much foundationally the people that worked there have so much to do with where I have been able to get to in my career a having so many amazing women in leadership positions it was 
dominated by women. And so seeing yourself reflected in the leadership gave you that, you know, that understanding that you could get there one day. But also we just all really liked each other. Like Jordan wasn't wrong. We liked hanging out with each other. We we hung out with each other a ton, which I think made, you know, clients want to hang out with us because when you see two people having fun or a group of people having fun, you want to join that group of people. So we all just really enjoyed each other's company, but also there was a ton of hustle in that company. You know, the sales team was sharp. The, um, the, the support teams were amazing and efficient and, you know, so client focused. I think when you're running a company that doesn't really own anything, your ability to pull money out of the market is based on how well your team is going to service the market as opposed to anyone else. People have to like working with you. They have to trust you. They have to respect you. And I think, you know, Olive did an amazing job of, of, aggregating all of those things together as its foundational core. Talk to me about the differences at working at La Presse versus Torstar and Olive. One big thing that strikes me is, is that you were at the head office in Toronto, and now you move to a company where you're working at a satellite office because the head office is in Montreal. Obviously, putting mm-hmm. aside the big differences is that you know one publication, one publication is in French versus all of where I assume a majority of what you were selling was in English. But tell me about the differences there. Yeah, that was uh, that was a real perspective shift, and also just moving to a company that you know was was historically a print. So I had been at a company who was at the forefront of digital for the past nine years, and then moving over to a company where print was still valued because it was still bringing in a lot of money. Um, but working at a satellite office on one hand was challenging, but I just because, you know, there are simple communication issues that I actually think COVID has helped us to overcome really, really quickly, where you don't necessarily feel like you're involved in all the conversations and you do feel like you get the information last to a certain extent, regardless of whether or not that, you know, it's never intentional. It's just the way that it happens. People walk by each other's desks and have casual conversations. And that's more challenging when you're in a small office. But I will say the people that I worked with at La Presse in my little satellite office felt like family. It was, again, a really great team atmosphere. We all really enjoyed each other's company. And so it, you know, it was a satellite office, but we enjoyed, you know, kind of being the little outcasts in the Toronto market. What brought you to Palmerex? Did you find the role or did the role find you? It was a little bit of both. I mean, I have always kept in in close contact with a lot of people that I worked with primarily at Olive because that was my that was my foundation. Um, and and the opportunity just kind of presented itself. And so I had worked at La Presse for two years um, and it was it was really great. But I felt to a certain extent, you know, working in a satellite office like I'd done what I could do and go on the places that I could go in my career at that company. And so the opportunity came up to kind of help start a data business. And just like I didn't know much about mobile when I decided to become, you know, a mobile only salesperson, I didn't know a ton about data moving into that business other than the fact that I had the the data that we were talking about was based on, you know, location data, which is app based. So I had a foundational understanding of of mobile and what app-based data meant, but how to sell it, how to productize it, how to bring it to market was all really new to me. And that part was really exciting. Uh, In my career, I always want to be growing. I always want to be learning. And then I met Bala, who is our chief data officer. And I, he is essentially my university professor. We get into boardrooms and I just ask him to explain life to me as well as, as uh, you know, tech and data. And it's just a really great environment. And I could kind of tell that even from the interview process, it's a really great environment to learn. It's a company that has done a really good job of kind of staying at the forefront of what is new and what is changing and is a company that has embraced change in its 30 years. And as a result is, is thriving in an industry and a market where change is constant and, and happening faster than ever these days. 
you said something really interesting there. There's a there's someone at the company that you can pull into a boardroom and just pick their brain and have them just break down whatever that new data product is or that new insight or anything like that. And I got to say, I'm the exact same way as well. I've got people in the industry when I don't understand something, I am not shy about picking up the phone or sending them an email going, I don't know what this means. People are throwing acronyms at me. We got to talk about that. Do you find that that really helps you? Oh my gosh. Mentorship is mentorship is so incredibly important. And I don't think we need to use the word mentorship in, you know, a formal way. We don't have to say like, mm, like write a letter being like, will you be my mentor? Um, it's just, you meet people within your career who you know are incredibly smart, are really well-versed in a specific area. And yeah, you, I will attach myself to those people because the idea that I can learn and understand everything from reading tech blogs is, you know, is nonsense. I need to be able to bounce ideas off of people. I need to be able to ask stupid questions in a really safe environment and not have someone laugh at me, but have someone understand that I'm asking stupid questions because I really want to know the nuts and bolts of how something worked. Because eventually I'm likely going to need to get, you know, on a, on a Skype call in front of clients and explain that very same thing. And so I have been so fortunate to have great mentors you know, Karen Wang was my sales mentor. And then Simon was my business leader mentor. And now I have Bala uh, Gopalakrishnan, who is my data and tech mentor. And I I count myself so lucky to have had these people in my life, because they have helped to get me to where I am today and have done so with, you know, love and grace. For me, it's less about reading tech blogs, but more or less calling those people and then watching YouTube videos. I just find that I absorb it a lot more if I drop mm -hmm. something like ads.txt into a YouTube video and I can eventually find it where someone has, someone has dumbed it down so I can understand yeah. it a lot better. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, in, in my leadership role, I try and do that to with my team and, and anyone I talk to as well, where you want to create that safe space. I feel like our industry can be really, really intimidating. And so you want to create that safe space for people where they can ask the questions that they have and not feel like they're going to be judged for it, to feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask this question eight different ways until I understand the answer. It's kind of like some of this stuff is like riding a bike where I don't get it and I don't get it and I don't get it until I do. And then once I got it, I got it. Celeste, this has been a fantastic chat. I've got a couple of rapid fire questions for you. The first one, the campaign you're most proud of. The one that always springs to mind is we did a we did a mobile based campaign when I was the mobile SME at Olive, um, where we worked with this um, little group of engineers who essentially made it so that no matter where you saw the mobile ad, it called out your neighborhood. It was with uh, an automotive company. So it was like, hey, Parkdale, did you know you're close to XX dealership? Which at the time, I think it was, you know, 2013 felt revolutionary when really it was just the advent of super personalized, uh, super personalized ads. But it was cool. It, it was cool at the time and in the moment. Your favorite movie? I don't have like a go-to favorite movie, but I've been re-watching a lot of 80s movies with my kids um, during the pandemic. And so we just finished the Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey series. Uh, and I'll tell you, they hold up. <laughs> well, that's good. We just got, we just got the, <laughs> I guess they completed the trilogy just a month or two ago. Yeah, I didn't include the last one in that comment intentionally. <laughs> it's weird watching a mature Keanu Reeves without a beard. I'm just so used oh my to the God, beard. Right? It was the beard that was different. It really threw you off. And like, if you watch them back to back, which we did, like, you know, back to back over a course of days, his voice is like his voice got older. I didn't know your voice got older, but it did. I always ask people their favorite video game, but you're more of a board game person. So what's your go to there? I am a board game person and I'm a, I'm a pretty competitive board game person. I have two go-tos. One is Ticket to Ride, um, which I call Trains exclusively. Anyone who's played it knows that it is a wonderful game, but not very social because most of the time you're just strategizing and not talking. Um, so my favorite talking game is right now is Code Names, which I am either very good at or terrible at. It depends on the day. If Hollywood were to make a movie based on your life, who would you want to play you? I'm going with Morgan Freeman because I feel like he could use a challenge. <laughs> there we go. That, that, that should nap him an Oscar. <laughs> Your favorite book? Uh, my favorite book? Oh, anything Harry Potter. 
I'm a huge Harry Potter nerd. Um, everyone knows this and gets very annoyed by it because I start most, you know, anytime anyone starts on my team or at the company, I make them take the sorting hat quiz, but I try and guess what house I think they're going to be in before they take the sorting hat quiz. It's, you know, something that I should be embarrassed about, but I'm definitely not. So what house would you be part of? Um, so this is... This is hard to talk about, but I'm a Hufflepuff. Um, so anyway, D- Victor, have you read Harry Potter? Uh, no, but my wife is dedicated to Harry Potter, and I've watched all the movies. I think Hufflepuff's the yellow one. Or the Hufflepuff blue? is the yellow one, and okay. it's the it's the house in the series that doesn't get a lot of love, and you know are kind of kind of the underdogs of everything. We don't have a lot of like special powers, and so. The first time I took the sorting hat quiz, I got Hufflepuff and like slammed my laptop shut and didn't tell anyone and then waited like six months and took it again under a different email address (laughs) and got it again. And I was like, I just have to accept the fact that I'm Hufflepuff. And so I looked up a whole bunch of celebrities that are also Hufflepuff. The Rock is a Hufflepuff. Um, and I've really just embraced it now. I went to, um, the Harry Potter, like you can go to the Warner Brothers set in England where all of the movies were made and I bought myself a sweet Hufflepuff sweatshirt. And uh, yeah, now I'm really, I'm a proud Hufflepuff. I did that with my wife. Uh, we went to that a couple of years ago and something I noticed when we end up in the gift shop, because all of these big tours, what they do is get you all hyped up and then they park you in the gift shop at the end. We went, cause I'm a big tie guy. We went to the tie section and yeah. they had ties for every house except Slytherin. They were completely sold out. Yeah, so that says something. I've got a lot of pride. Are you Slytherin, Victor? I haven't taken the test, but I think I got, oh God, what was the house that Harry was in? It's maroon and yellow. Gryffindor. I'm gonna... Gryffindor. Gryffindor. That's it. So I bought yeah. the tie from there, but I wanted Slytherin because I like the color green. <laughs> but, but I was just a... Be a secret Slytherin. I mean, let's do another two hours of podcast and I'll have you, I'll, ha- I'll have you pointed out. I'll get the butterbeer. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Your favorite song. My favorite song, I have a lot of favorite songs, but I would say if I had to pick one that I had to listen to for the rest of my life, um, it would either be Jesus, Etc. by Wilco or Copperhead Road by Steve Earle. The best advice you have ever received? The best personal advice I've ever received was from my dad. And he said, just do the work. Just do it. Just do it. Just do the work. He had a real work ethic. Uh, The best work advice that I ever received was actually from um, my cousin. And this was when I was just interviewing in Toronto before I got my Toronto.com job. And I had interviewed for something and didn't get it. And I was really upset. And he's a headhunter. So I went and chatted with him. And he said, look, don't come here to find yourself. Find yourself and then come here. That is what an employer is looking for. They're not looking to help you discover who you are. They're looking for someone who knows who they are, who knows what they want, and so that they can hire that person to do a job incredibly well. And if you don't know who you are yet, just fake it. If you could go back in time and give your younger self advice, what would you say? I would say that if you are lucky, life is very long. And so you really don't need to rush everything or anything. Just take your time. My signature closing question, if you weren't in media, what would you be doing and why? Oh, I mean, if falling into media was a bit of an accident. So I probably would have continued interviewing at HR jobs and probably would have failed miserably um, in any of those roles because anyone who knows me knows I've got a pretty bad potty mouth. If me too as well. Celeste, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. No problem at all. Thanks for chatting. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to mediapeople.ca or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at VicGenova.